He's just a little guy, isn't he? Sort of like a tree. Mmm. Um, Lavender <coughs> is Dutch for keeper or steward. And, and my, it was anglicized when the English <coughs> took over the New York colonies. So my people are from a set of villages on the New York-Vermont border where we have been for over 400 years. And all my siblings are still in Washington County on the Vermont border. So I come out of very deep place-based story. And my family, both of my parents were storytellers and would take us to cemeteries for picnics and battlegrounds for picnics. So there was always a place element in everything we did. And um, um, I believe that social forestry is the human task that we for millions of years have been tending treed landscapes savannas, edges of forests. So we've been in relationship to complexity for an extremely long time. It's built into us. And so I'm going to throw out some of my favorite tropes, I call them bumper stickers, and, um, and say a little bit, and then I'd love to like sort of go through questions, and because I love to answer questions. And um, so first, the forest misses us. It's lonely. Humans are highly entertaining. <laughs> and there's three yes. very important things that we do very well. And the first is that we pee, we urinate. And our urine is an incredibly good fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's mostly sterile, and it's where the most readily available nutrients are uh, delivered, if you will. And it depends on where you pee. So that's, that's the first thing. It's a great, it's a way of us to reciprocate. It's a gifting we give back. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is humans are utterly silly. We are so incredibly silly. I mean, are you kidding? Do you know what we look like to all the rest of life? Oh my gosh. I mean, Clothes? <laughs> What's that about? And all these tools? You got what do you gotta carry them around or something? I mean what 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 are they thinking? I mean humans are just just really silly. Ultimately silly. Crazy silly. And the third thing I think, in my shorthand, that humans are good for is we make messes. We're really good at making messes. And messes in ethnobotany or anthropology are called disturbance regimes. So how we make messes is our art. This is what we do. We make messes. We stir things up. We disturb things. We move things around. And that's quite appreciated in many very complex ways. So there's the top three. Um, and then I'll go a little philosophical here.
and I'll say, complexity is beyond our understanding. Humans, uh, modern humans especially, would benefit from a little humility. And some of the messes we make, we think of as fixes. We, we call, I call them complications. We do things in complicated ways. We plan, we organize, we gather, we put things together. We're complicated. But complication is not enough to deal with complexity. Our complications are weak. And they are brittle because they're incomplete. They're not actually holistic. They're just reaching for holism. And Alan Savory, famous for holistic range management and other things, is <clears throat> in his dotage, he's a little frustrated. And I read an interview with him a few years ago that got my attention because he said, there are cultures who have learned to think holistically, but none who have learned to manage holistically. So this is our challenge. And I would suggest that the social in social forestry has to do with coming into relationship with complexity. And when you're working in the forest, it helps to notice. Noticing is the important word. And this is, this is beautifully laid out um, in a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World by uh, Margaret Zing. Uh, professor of Anthropology at UC Santa Cruz. Okay, let me see how thicker I can make this right now. Um, so, when you're, if we are working in the forest in a friendly enough way, we're not disturbing things too much, then we might notice emergent properties of complexity. In other words, reading complexity cannot be done directly. We need to have clues as humans. We're looking for something to jump out at us. It's important that we see seeing something move in our peripheral vision. We might notice something. So how do we prepare ourselves as a culture to notice emergent properties of complexity? It's a big question because modernity is characterized by fragmentation and alienation. We are encouraged to be hyper-individualistic. Mm -hmm. We always look for our own interests. And we've been taught that if we do this, it helps everything else. I would disagree. It's culture tending that is necessary in order to deal with complexity. No one person knows truth. Only cultural processes hold wisdom. And that's a big challenge. And one of the gifts that I bring, and we'll see how much we can unfold it, is that I'm from a remnant traditional culture known 
as the Hicksite Quakers. Plain clothes Quakers. I was raised with a different language. It was called plain speech. And my Hicksite ancestors uh, in the 1700s saw all of this coming and criticized it. And we were isolated, both by ourselves, it was called, we called it living within the hedge. We called it, we called, we called our love for each other a hedge. And we were known for speaking, and are still known, for speaking blunt truths, which we had gathered through processes of clearness, of consideration, in a corporate fashion. And we mean corporate as the whole body, the cultural body. So that's what a country hick is. I'm the actual thing. <laughs> I'm an original hick. And what, think about that. What, what do you think about when you think about a country hick? Simple. Hmm? Simple. Simple. That's right. Big part of Hicksite Quakerism, simplicity. What else do you think about? Clueless. Yeah. Which doesn't jive with what you're saying, and yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Unfriendly. Standoffish. Remote. Okay? Which comes off as clueless. Because... We don't buy it. We're critical of capitalism, commercialism, <laughs> um, a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I could keep going and going, and we don't need to go into all of that, right? Because I do want to get to forestry. But um, I, I'm praising my ancestors, right? I'm thanking them for this gift because even though our culture was forced, and by the way, the Quakers split, so most Quakers are the Philadelphia Quakers. And there was a big split in the early 1800s, which happened at the same time as the tent revivals. So evangelicism was a tool of industrialization and look where it has brought us now and we were extremely critical of evangelicism and even though we saw that no that we appeared to be clueless we felt we needed to hold truth so one of our favorite phrases is the book, it will perish. And the steeple will fall. But the truth will be there at the end of it all. So we have a very strong sense of how to deal with reality. And it's not easy has to be done through a cultural process. And my Hicksite ancestors gave me a passport. And this passport has allowed me to deal with indigenous people all over the planet. They can see me coming. I totally, when I taught in South Africa, I look like an Afrikaner. When I taught in Taiwan, I looked like an American. When I, so, but indigenous people in those places 
go, oh, you're a traditional. We can tell. So we can use that phrase, a traditional. We are actually settlers. I don't see a lot of others in this room. So I'm going to guess. Do you have a culture background from some interesting place? Yes, I'm, my mother's from Korea. Yeah. South Korea. Yeah. So you probably can relate to some of what I'm saying here. There's, there's, there's taboos and etiquette. These are some of the aspects of culture that we don't understand now. Okay? So taboos are what not to do, and etiquette is how to do things right. And those truths are held in culture. They're reinforced through culture. And this has been difficult for landed peoples, and we are now in a condition of massive urbanization, where the degraded landscapes that have been overextracted have weakened grounded landed local cultures, people of place, caused there to be misunderstandings between generations and the youth head for the city. And the promise that is given is you can be anything, you can have anything. Come on, join in. But it is alienation and fragmentation. And we're left like the Tower of Babylon, not understanding each other. So, my general recommendation is that we as settlers become people of place. And the first thing we need to do to become people of place is have the intention. Okay, I'm going to stick around. Now, <clears throat> luckily I've been questioned on that point, so I'll jump. Um, you can be people of multiple places. But your relation to each of those places needs to be very well developed. A lot of information, a lot of knowledge, a lot of holding, a lot of connection. And I usually say, let's start with children's pilgrimage because that was done for me. So at different seasons of the year, if we take our children on the same walk every year to the same place, and we do it around a small watershed, a creek, or a rivulet, or a marsh, or a sand spit, <laughs> we, we, Tell the stories of place. And pretty soon the, elder, the older children are telling the younger children. And then when they grow up, they come back because they want to see that rock again where that story was told. And again, I bring this gift to you. My people are still doing this. And I am a political refugee. I came out here during Vietnam <clears throat> because I was doing medical relief work and I was on Nixon's enemies of the state list. Mm -hmm. So where do you go when you're on an enemy of the state list? Berkeley, right? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> so I want to thank the East Bay saved my butt. <laughs> Absolutely. It was wonderful. I mean, to just arrive here and, and find this place, which I now love. 
and now I have many places that I want. So, uh, meanwhile, I got two degrees in forestry. Uh, <laughs> my family always did forestry work. We brought the forest into our homes during the so-called Christian holidays. And Hicksite Quakers are quasi-Christian. We don't believe in baptism with water. There's a bunch of other things that we're super radical about. And it all comes from careful study and careful conversation, reaching towards clearness. And when a Quaker meeting is gathered, the room fills with light. And it's palpable. You can see it. You can feel it. And that's what we call baptism. Baptism by the light, which only comes in community, in relationship. It is not an individual experience. And if you have an experience of baptism by the light, the first thing the elders say is, take it to clearness committee. Then you go to clearness committee and you sit down, here's all these elders, they start talking to you in plain speech, and you go, I had this experience. And they go, oh yeah, that's number 23C, and uh, so and so and so and so had it, and here's how you deal with it, kid. And you go, oh. things that are going to happen? Sure, pay attention. So, I've just given you a whole bunch of clues, right? Sideways, orthogonal clues of what we need to do to do culture tending in order to do forest tending. Because we need to have that grounding of culture. When, when in Quaker Meeting for Business we reach unanimous consent, the work just magically gets done. There's no resistance. Everyone has become clear. And then you get organized. Okay, one more, one more thing. Um, 